sure I got everyone correct, uh, so I'll try to go through the aisle. Representative Birch, welcome to Senate Finance. Representative Tallarico, uh, House Majority Leader, uh, House Minority Leader Millett, uh, Representative Rauschner, Representative Kopp, Representative, Representative uh, Sullivan, Representative Tilton, Representative Wilson, uh, Representative Chenault. Is there any, anyone uh, elected that I have not rec recognized? Thank you for joining us in Senate Finance today. Is there anything to come before the committee before we begin? Members of Senate Finance, the general public, and all of our legislative colleagues, uh, Alaska is facing a really, really tough time. $2.78 billion of revenue shortfall for this year in FY18's budget. Last year was over a $4 billion uh, deficit. Before that, it was in the $3 billion number. All in all, we have removed from our savings accounts over $10 billion and are set to withdraw close to another $3 billion, placing Alaska's savings account in a very difficult situation. The Senate believes we have presented a, ha a plan to the other body. We have tried to propose responsible cuts to reduce Alaska's footprint. We have proposed a spending limit that continues downward pressure on the budget, and we propose structural reforms targeted at the largest cost drivers of the state. We are requiring reductions from the other body and this administration and an, an obligation to institute a spending limit before we access use of Alaska's earnings reserves. But Alaska's earning reserves are the only cornerstone component of anything Alaska has at its, at its disposal to try to address a $2.78 billion revenue shortfall. Are there other comments from committee members before we begin? I'd like to invite David Teal and Rob Carpenter. Alexi Painter, thank you. To the microphones, gentlemen, if you could identify yourself for the record, um, and if we change speakers, if you would identify yourself for the general public who's listening at home so that they know who's speaking if they don't have a, a TV monitor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm David Teal, Director of Legislative Finance Division. Rob Carpenter, Legislative Finance Division. Alexi Painter, Legislative Finance Division. Welcome to Senate Finance. Thank you. Um, you ask us here to this morning to talk to the committee about the Senate version of SB 26. And this is a bill that touches every Alaskan, not just because it sets a formula for permanent fund dividends, but because it affects the way we fund government and the level of funding that's available to government. So that affects the level of services that government can provide. So in short, SB 26 provides a fiscal plan and we'll address two issues this morning. The first is why we need a plan, which you summarized uh, just a moment ago, and then does SB 26 offer a solution to our fiscal problem? So, slide two gives a good indication that we have a fiscal problem on this chart, uh, which shows a line depicting our, our revenue. It's unrestricted general fund revenue, and the bars indicate unrestricted general fund expenditures. The dark is agency operations, the lighter blue is statewide items, and yellow is capital. As you can see, we've made tremendous reductions in spending from a peak of 7.8 in FY13 down to 4.1 billion in, is the Senate's budget this year. <clears throat> but we face a large deficit. You mentioned 2.78. That is the, the fall forecast numbers, et cetera. It's, it, it's conceptually, it doesn't make any difference. We're using now a $2.5 billion deficit for 18. That's with 
the higher spring forecast numbers. And uh, that's both revenue and, or sorry, production and price. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, not too far in the past, a two and a half billion dollar um, deficit could be absorbed by our reserves. But as this figure shows, we're now in our sixth consecutive year that spending has exceeded revenue. That gives you a reserves chart that looks like this. We had $16.3 billion at the end of FY13. Those six years of deficits have reduced <clears throat> our reserves down to about $2.5 billion. That's at the end of 18. It assumes we fill the 17 deficit with a draw from the Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund, the CBR, in both 17 and in 18. Worse, the outlook is for continuing deficits if we continue doing what we're doing. And I don't want to turn this into a long discussion of, of the implications of revenue covering less than half of current expenditures um, or talking about what we're going to do when <coughs> reserves are gone. Um, those are a lot of policy decisions, and it's precisely why you have SB 26 in front of you, so those events don't occur. Um, the only point I want to make before leaving this slide is this. The CBR, Constitutional Budget Reserve Fund, serves not only as a shock absorber to absorb the deficits, but also as a cash management tool. Even in times of surpluses, we start the year uh, with little revenue and high cash outflow. And to fill that, those early in the year cash needs, we borrow from the CBR. Again, even in times of big surpluses. So uh, OMB believes that we need a minimum balance of about two and a half billion dollars in the CBR to serve that function of cash management tool. That's, that's the bare minimum uh, for that purpose. It doesn't leave you a whole lot of room for the CBR being used as a shock absorber. So now that we've seen the fiscal problem, uh, the question is, what does a solution look like? And slide four presents several questions. They're not statements, they're questions because there can be, will be, disagreement on how to measure success in, in, uh, in addressing the problem. Uh, I can't define healthy reserves for you. Does it mean the bare minimum 2.5 that uh, OMB has, has cited? Or does healthy reserves meaning you're actually building balances? Policy question. Some may say, I just want the problem solved. I don't particularly care how you do it. Others may, may note that the path is just as important as the destination. And that's how much are dividends? How big is government? How much do I actually have to pay for that government? Again, questions with major policy implications that that we're not going to address. You need to address those. Uh, points one and two up there overlap substantially. Maybe they're even the same question phrased in a different way. I saw point one as a direct response to the problem of vanishing reserves and what you might need to do about them. Point two is, is up there because I think it's a better way to emphasize the path as opposed to the destination alone. There, if, if balanced budget is a goal, do you try to balance the budget immediately? Or is a glide path acceptable, or maybe even preferable, to immediately balancing the budget? Obviously, you can balance the budget at any level, given a sufficient amount of revenue. And so your, your question is, is really, 
how big a budget do you want knowing that at some point you're going to have to balance that and you're going to have to generate revenue in order to balance that. So uh, how do you choose that level of expenditure? So the, the point is that choosing a path involves many policy decisions. Those policy decisions are addressed by SB 26. So what path does SB 26 put you on? Just go through the major points. Mr. Yep. Till, we have a question. Senator Machicki. Just back one slide. Your question number one, I, I, uh, all those sentences end with a question mark, and I understand why. But certainly, as ledge finance, you have some philosophy, right? You talk about a policy call on a healthy fund balance. Do you look at something like one year of UGF spend and reserve in the CBR? I mean, you personally, what what is your um, definition of adequate fund balance? And and I I have to say that I don't believe that government's role is uh, is being a bank, right? I don't think, especially when you're talking about potential revenues in the future um, that come from Alaskans in one form or another. I don't think building a fund balance is a primary function of government. I think adequate funding for essential services um, is a better definition, right? So on that question of reserves, and just personally, what does David Teal feel is adequate for reserves, particularly in the CBR? Uh, through the chair, Senator Machicki. I agree with OMB that $2.5 billion is the minimum for cash flow. I don't think cash flow is adequate, those reserves. I would prefer to see a minimum balance closer to $5 billion, which is roughly equal to a full year's budget. But as you noted, that's a, that's a personal opinion. And on building reserves uh, beyond $5 billion, I think doing that is just fine as long as you're meeting the needs of the citizens first. And if you can build reserves beyond that, great. Because, you know, bear market, bull market, wherever we may be uh, in oil prices and, and returns, in other words, are we at a low point in our reserves and are, and they, are they going to recover naturally? Or, uh, you know, do we need to build reserves if times get better so that we have the reserves to weather um, another situation like we've just gone through? I would hate to imagine what would happen if we hadn't had $16 billion in reserves because we'd be facing a very different present than we're facing now. Thank you, Mr. Teal. Senator Michigi, follow-up? Fine, thank you. Thank you. I would like to uh, uh, recognize again Representative Sol Sullivan Leonard as well as Representative Johnston and Representative Johnson that have both joined us. Thank you. Please continue. Okay, so s slide five talks about what SBS or sorry, SB 26 actually does. The most significant policy change in the bill is use of permanent fund earnings to fund government operations. This provision is the primary deficit filler. The way it works is a payout from the earnings reserve account in the permanent fund of 5.25% for three years, dropping to 5% after that, goes to the general fund. That amounts to $1.8 billion or so and growing over time under the baseline assumptions. So that, that greatly reduces the size of the deficit. It also reduces revenue volatility by providing a source of revenue that's large, as large as or, or could be larger than our traditional source of oil, which is or revenue, which is oil. So that's important. It helps us uh, get rid of those ups and downs in, in revenue that are so difficult to, 
you know, to fill. It, re it reduces the amount we need to draw from the CBR. So the bill also revises the formula for dividends. Instead of basing dividends on permanent fund earnings, dividends will now be based on the balance of the permanent fund, including the earnings reserve account. So a 25% pay share of that payout goes to dividends. That's roughly $1,000 per person per year. And some may wonder how the dividend amount avoids the problem or affects the problem of vanishing reserves. I can tell you that's real easy linkages there. As dividends go up, government share of the payout goes down. The total payout is going to be five and a quarter percent or going to five percent. As dividends take a greater share of that, there's less of it goes to government, which means the deficit goes up, which means reserves go down. So dividends clearly and directly affect the health of reserves. Third on here is a payout limit, which further reduces revenue volatility by cutting off revenue peaks. It also increases future payouts, both to the general fund and to dividends. There's an appropriation limit or spending limit in the bill. That cuts off the revenue peaks beyond those that would be affected by the, the revenue or payout limit. Note that you won't see either of these limits take effect in the model scenarios that, that we'll be running after the few PowerPoint slides. Um, that doesn't mean the limits are ineffective. It means the limits kick in only if revenues are much higher than we expected in the base scenario. And those scenarios that we start with, the base scenario, is stable earnings at the rate projected by the permanent fund. And the oil price assumptions are the official forecast, which is basically in the middle, half the time we expect to have higher oil prices, half the time lower. So it's kind of midline, baseline projections. Um, we don't worry too much about modeling scenarios with high revenue because that's not a problem for you. Uh, it's, it's real easy to, to have a fiscal plan when deficits are eliminated. So what's important to know here is that if you have the good fortune of high revenues, these limits will restrain expenditures. They may not work under the, the models we'll be showing you. And finally, the bill redirects some royalties to the general fund. The Constitution requires that 25% of royalties go into the general fund by statute we can place another 25% on new fields, which by this time that means about 30 years old. Um, that amounts to 60 or $70 million per year and growing. So again, that helps our, with increase our general fund revenue, reducing the, the deficits. <clears throat> this is a screenshot of model output under baseline assumptions. Now, those baseline assumptions are an OMB growth forecast, and you'll see that in a in an increasing expenditure line. It's, these are hard to see. We will focus in, or you can look on your sheet. It's easier to see them there. But you'll note that the budget's growing from about five billion to six five billion dollars now to six billion dollars by the end of the forecast period. This is not completely an inflation adjusted um, forecast. It has retirement assistance growing from approximately two hundred million dollars now to about four hundred fifty million dollars. So it's growing the, the entire uh, expenditure line, which is growing at slightly faster than inflation. We're using the DOR, Department of Revenue, spring price forecast. 
that's the, the mid line price forecast. We're using a P10 production forecast. We did get some new numbers uh, from revenue yesterday. We didn't have time to build them into the model. Uh, you had a long discussion with Department of Revenue about the production forecast and the fact that 18 was a stale number on production. We've adjusted that by using the P10 forecast, which means that, that you're going to be uh, at or above that 90% of the time or below at 10% of the time, whichever way you care to look at it, so that we think it's going to be very similar to the revised forecast, but we haven't had a chance to look. It gets rid of that 12% drop that bothered so many of you in, in pr that 12% production decline from 17 to 18, starting out at about 475,000 barrels per day with a uh, slower decline than the mid-production mid forecast would have. So we think it's a, it's a reasonable adjustment to the forecast and should be just about uh, the same as, as when we build the, the new numbers into the model. And finally, we go ahead. Did you have a question? Mr. Teal, uh, two points. Uh, first, I wanted to welcome Representative Reinbold and Representative Kopp uh, to the conversation this morning. And second, when we are looking at these quadrants, uh, and we've had this discussion before, but there may be new Alaskans following the conversation. Uh, we are trying to show in this baseline of 26 uh, particular assumptions that are made uh, because almost all of these models are going to be wrong. Uh, but we are trying to use the best information we have available to us to forecast out and to look reflectively and then test uh, particular actions. So when we're specifically looking at the the budget growth. That is not an endorsement by anyone that that's where the budget's going to go. That is an OMB projection on, on going forward how the budget will grow if nothing else transpires. Is that accurate? Madam Chairman, it is. Uh, as with all models, they are projections. I don't think anyone wants to call them predictions. There's a difference there. And we use numbers provided by Department of Revenue, by Department of Natural Resources, by OMB, by the Permanent Fund, because as model builders, we don't want to be put in the position of using our own assumptions, because I, as, as you're implying, your assumptions determine your output. And what we try to choose are assumptions, inputs, that are the best numbers from the people best qualified to produce those numbers. So they are what we consider to be a reasonable starting point. We would say, well, OMB's expenditure projection means you keep up with inflation. That may not necessarily be the case. We're not saying that is going to happen. We're just using it as a starting point so that when we get to the models, you can say, we don't intend to do that. Try another scenario with something less than keeping up with inflation. Thank you, Mr. Teal. I have a, a couple of follow-ups. When we're looking at uh, the, the unrestricted revenue budget uh, projection, uh, there are different colors that those that might be following at home may or may not understand. And that's, uh, if you could go through what the colored bars mean on the budgeting graph to, for clarity on why there's different colors uh, supporting uh, uh, state, state services. Certainly. Before I do that, one more assumption, and that's the permanent funds rate of return of 6.95%. That basically makes the model run. On those assumptions, you have, uh, in this quadrant, the upper left, you see 
the expenditure line. That's the one that's growing. That's the OMB forecast. The bars are the revenue, and the bars are broken into pieces. The blue is our traditional revenue stream. That's oil and, and the interest in other things. It, it's, it's what we normally uh, would see in the, in the revenue forecast book. In addition to that, you can see that beginning here, we, we have a CBR draw, which, which vanishes beginning in 18, or not vanishes, but gets much smaller beginning in 18, because we're starting to get a payout from the earnings reserve account. So that bar builds on top of the traditional, leaving you with a deficit. Now, when you have a deficit, you fill it. We assume that filling it comes from the CBR. You can see here that, sorry, the mouse just keeps knocking into the, the microphone and it's like, try to move it and it doesn't go. Um, there is a deficit. You can also see that deficit here in the lower left quadrant because a deficit means a declining CBR balance. And it looks like I must have moved, I did, yeah. So this emphasizes the deficits that appear here, also show here. In this lower right quadrant is permanent fund information. Under the baseline assumptions, you can see that the permanent fund is growing to approximately $70 billion by 26, and that is 108% uh, of its FY17 value expanded for inflation or inf inflated value. So the permanent fund is keeping up with inflation. It is not being depleted. It's in fact gaining. Here in the upper right, you see that dividends are roughly $1,000 and are pretty flat. So it's this quadrant that we believe is, is what you're probably paying attention to most today because these quadrants aren't going to change much. You've got the same payout unless you want to start modifying payouts. Dividends aren't going to change much. What may change is your expenditures, your revenues, your deficits, and uh, 